In the heart of the Indian Ocean, Mauritius and its colorfully alluring lagoons shelter long white sandy beaches. This island and its sumptuous landscapes, poised between Africa and Asia, is also a multicultural haven. Over the course of its turbulent history, Mauritius has forged an identity that can be seen in the mixed ethnic and cultural diversity of its origins. Today, Mauritius reveals infinite and harmonious charm, the result of the relentless efforts of its people, who have made their island a veritable multifaceted gem. We're in the south. Maebul Bay is one of the most beautiful bays in Mauritius. Maebo rises with the sun. It's only five in the morning, yet Indiren and his nephew Nelvi are getting ready to go fishing. The sea urchins that will be used as bait are already on board. The men only have to fashion seaweed balls and place them in the traps. These large traps are their main tackle. Along the way, Nelvi tries his luck, but only loses a line. Hauling in the traps requires coordination and strength. Here, fishing is a very physical occupation. We only fish using traps. So the sea has to be calm if we're going to get a good catch. Once the fish and the lobsters have been hauled in, the two fishermen reset the traps with new bait. They must make sure that the traps sit horizontally on the sandy bottom below. They must not be caught or jammed in the coral reef. Sometimes Indiren has to dive in and free a trap from the reef. On the Ile de la Passe, this fort attests to the naval battles that occurred in 1810 when the British unsuccessfully attempted to block the French Navy. But the day is not over yet. A fresh supply of sea urchins and sea lettuce must be gathered and prepared for tomorrow's fishing. Nelvi has found a large clam. It's a perfect snack until dinner time, particularly when accompanied by this lobster, which is too damaged to be sold to a restaurant. Blue Bay Marine Park is nearby. This is a protected lagoon, and thanks to this marine refuge, the coral reefs, which had been steadily deteriorating, have now begun to recuperate. David has carefully observed them for many years. It's one of the largest lagoons in Mauritius, and the marine park covers 353 hectares. Really huge. Things are improving. The Blue Bay Marine Park is a natural reserve. The coral is regenerating, it's reproducing, it's growing again. The marine park is a godsend for the coral. As a direct consequence of this revived environment, the ocean is teeming with a surprising diversity of species. The Reefal Channel is the other strategic point of the marine park. 
The channel gives access to the ocean. It's very important. It contributes to the reproduction of the reef. It regulates the salinity of the water and the currents, which are important for the development of the coral. The Mont Brabant rock at the southwestern tip of the island is the icon of Mauritius. At the foot of a lagoon, this monolith soars majestically skywards. Jessa attaches great importance to this mountain. It's a symbol of the dramatic history of the island. The rock became a refuge for runaway slaves who climbed to the top of the mountain to hide. The slaves came down at night to fish and to find food. Then they climbed up again before daybreak in order to share their fare. The climb is dangerous, and the fugitives must have had great difficulty. This memorial site also offers any modern-day climbers a unique view of the island. This mountain is really important for us. When slavery was abolished by the English on the 1st of February, 1835, officers arrived with soldiers. They intended to tell the fugitives that slavery had been abolished and that they were free. But when the fugitives saw the soldiers, they thought that the army was coming to recapture them. So they decided to die by jumping off the mountainside. They preferred to kill themselves rather than to return to their masters as slaves. It's a place of worship which was created by Rastafarians in memory of our slave ancestors who gave their lives for us. It's a place where we can venerate them, a place that we established here. It's a place respected by all Rastafarians as well as by the local population. On the heights near the village of Chamarel, a Rastafarian community lives in the forest. Robert is the eldest member. He has not cut his hair or beard for decades. Tonight, André pays him a visit. For me, it's been 19 years. For Robert, it's been nearly 35 years. He hasn't shaved or cut his hair since 1976. At Chamarel were what's called Maroons, descendants of slaves. It was the Maroon slaves that then became Rastafarians. We live off the land, we cultivate the soil, we raise chickens and goats to eat. Lower down, the village of Mon is predominantly inhabited by fishermen and craftsmen. Daily life is calm and peaceful. The road, which is hardly ever used, heads towards the east.
Kite surfers and artists also live in the village. The lagoon stretches to the foot of the rock. This idyllic setting has, from the very beginning, attracted many large hotels. At the foot of Limon, traditional massages are offered. Le Monde has history, and it's our force. The force of Le Monde emits good energy. When we were children and had stomach aches, our grandmothers and mothers would massage our bellies. And when a woman gives birth, we massage her belly. We also massage the baby. It was someone from the neighborhood, a local granny who did it. At Port-Louis, there are people from the Chinese community who practice shiatsu, reflexology, and acupuncture massages. At the spa, we have used the five principal elements of traditional Chinese medicine to create a new technique. Shiatsu is pressure being applied to the body. It's like acupuncture, but it's manual. At the beginning of the 2000s, a large part of the island was still covered by sugarcane plantations, which flourished on its volcanic soil. Since then, a worldwide crisis struck the sugar industry, and Mauritius was not exempt. In the south, sugar refineries closed, and the sugarcane fields were converted for other crops. But there is a tinge of nostalgia in the fields near the village of Iskali. The traditional jobs have also disappeared. These cane cutters are amongst the very last workers who still carry out this strenuous task manually. But here, the machines that have replaced most of the cane cutters cannot be used. Cutting is the easy part. We just leave the canes where they fall. But afterwards, we have to carry them about 100 meters to the trailer. That's where it becomes more complicated. Today, it's impossible for men to compete with these huge machines, which are capable of harvesting hundreds of hectares in a few hours. The only active factory in the south had modernized early in order to cut costs. But the timeless transport and processing of sugarcane is still a spectacular sight. Diversification of its products has also been a vital factor to the survival of the factory. Sugarcane juice is no longer used solely for making sugar. This spectacular notch in the rock is called the Tamarind Falls. During the rainy season, it discharges the stormwaters over a series of seven cataracts. The rest of the year, its flow is much less dramatic.
in the nearby Black River Gorge National Park, verdant flora thrives. The density of the vegetation, which makes access difficult, has put a natural limit to land development. Today, the park is a refuge for many species of birds, like the white-tailed tropic bird and the Mauritius parakeet. Further to the north, Grand Bassin is a curiosity located in the Mar aux Vacuas. This extinct crater lake that sits in the caldera of a volcano has been a Hindu place of pilgrimage for Mauritians more than a century. The lake waters are considered as a resurgence of the sacred Ganges River. Every year in February or March, depending upon the lunar calendar, about 300 to 500,000 Hindus gather here to honor Shiva. That's nearly half the population of the island. <laughs> and throughout the year, entire families come here to pray and bring offerings. Further north is Curepipe, the second largest town in Mauritius. With its cooler climate and pleasant summers, the town has always been a fashionable place of residence for the bourgeoisie. The Domaine des Aubineaux, built in 1872, is a good example of the refined style of French colonial architecture. This 750 square meter mansion illustrates the incredible affluence of the colonial families who acquired vast fortunes from the sugar industry before independence. We are of French origin. My ancestors arrived in Mauritius in 1793. I belong to the eighth generation. We began in sugarcane, and then in 1958, my grandfather invested in tea. He diversified. He invested in the tea trade and bought the Domaine de Boischerie. Entirely built of wood, these buildings require very specific maintenance to make them accessible to visitors. The Domaine de Boischerie is located a little bit further south, on the high plateau. Here, tea is harvested by hand. If we pick until noon, we can harvest up to 50, 60, or even 70 kilos a day per person. There are people who start picking at 4 o'clock in the morning. Some even start at 3 o'clock and finish work by 10. Manny, 78 years old, is the eldest woman on the domain. I started picking tea when I was 10 years old. There was no one at home, so we went to work in the fields with our parents. We worked until we became adults, then we got married. And after that, we returned to the fields and continued picking. The leaves are sent to a factory a few kilometers away. Here they're sorted and then dried. Nearly 70% of the production is consumed locally. The rest is exported as vanilla black tea. Mauritius is home to several branches of Hinduism. The Veena Vikram family are Telugu. They're preparing to celebrate Diwali, the Festival of Lights. It's one of the most important Hindu festivals. During the festival, sweetmeats are prepared and shared amongst family and neighbors. We share with everybody with Muslims, with Catholics, with Chinese, 
with everybody. Meanwhile, Vina Vikram's husband prepares the oil lamps that everyone on the island lights at nightfall. On the ground floor in a little room where the school teacher usually gives her lessons, the couple prays together in front of the family temple. Then they visit other family members who live in different houses built on the same allotment. Now, in front of the family temple, Vina and her husband recite a common prayer with an aunt. Sharing is an essential part of the Diwali festival. Vina will now visit neighbors and offer them the cakes that she's prepared. Nightfall approaches and it's time to light the venerated oil lamps. For Hindus, Diwali commemorates the victory of the god Rama over the demon Ravana. According to their beliefs, the victorious Rama was led back to his kingdom by lamps that people from every region had lit to guide his way and to celebrate his return. We light lamps in front of the door. This lights the way for the goddess Lashmi, so that she can enter our house and guide our house and our family. And because it's the symbol of light and of knowledge. All the houses in the neighborhood are illuminated. Most people use traditional lamps and a solemn and spiritual ambiance is created. But some have given in to the attraction of cheap electric lights. Garish, perhaps, but very popular with the younger people. Descending towards the sea, we come to a different, quite uncommon landscape, the Yemen salt marshes in Tamarin. These salt pans have the appearance of a giant marquetry, in which a liquid checkerboard disappears into the horizon. Today, the salt workers are worried. Recently, heavy rains have flooded and devastated the salt pans. Several days of work have been destroyed, and now the basins must be repaired. The technique for harvesting the salt is very simple. The evaporation pond basins are simply filled with seawater, and the salt crystals are collected after the water has evaporated under the hot sun. The Yemen salt works are a family business. They belong to the Mangald family. It's always been like that. They came to Tamaran because here the ground sloped and gravity made the seawater flow naturally into the ponds. Thirteen women work here. They're paid by the basket load. That's why they carry over 40 kilos on their heads. In principle, each basket should weigh 20 kilos. 
Vado nel taglio in una tassa di più. Ebbene. 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 Ebbene.
In November, fruit lovers rush to taste the superb pineapples and especially the lychees. The Tamil temple on the outskirts of town is similar to many others found all over the island. Brightly colored and adorned with many statuettes and bas-reliefs, it's a place of daily prayer. We return to Poudre d'Or on the east coast. It takes its name from the golden color of the sand on its beaches. This temple is dedicated to the goddess Ganga. As the personification of the Ganges, she possesses its power of purification. All around the temple, 27-year-old Babu brightens the walls with his art. Just a few hundred meters away, this temple dedicated to Shiva is unique. In order to solve their problems, the locals come and wrap wires around the sacred tree. They also come to pray to Shani, the god of the planet Saturn. At Poudreau, football-style haircuts are all the rage. In a quiet little street, Ramesh supplements his fishing income by making bamboo traps using completely natural materials. In winter, the fish won't go into traps made of plastic or wire. They like natural materials. Some fishermen like to buy them ready-made. Making them is a lot of work. You have to scrape them, wash them, and then dry them. Ramesh is very busy. His traps sell well. On the edge of the village, this large cross is very well known in Mauritius. This little animist sanctuary is reputed to grant the wishes of those who ask for them here. The few offerings left are of no great value. It's a big cross, and when you say a prayer to ask for something, you get your wish. But behind the cross, the offerings are of a very different nature. Some of them are rather gruesome. If you want to harm someone, you make a sacrifice, and the devil cuts that person's head off. Out near a crossroads, Joe is welcoming his first customers for lunch. He sells roti, a typical Mauritian dish. These flatbreads are made of flour and are garnished with lentils and various other ingredients. This is a betai roti. Betai is a mixture of shellfish. On the outskirts of the town, the imposing Marie Reine Chapel seems to protect the sugarcane fields. Built entirely of lava rock in 1847, it's the largest church in the Goodlands region. In Poudre d'Or Bay, the last fishermen are on their way home. A stone monument recalls the tragic fate of Paul and Virginie, the heroes of Bernardin de Saint-Pierre's once popular novel. Their story is set by these waters. Continuing northward, we reach the Bay of Saint-Bernard. This is where Rosamonde lives. She's a skilled cook who does her shopping in Goodlands. Pour eux, masala leur scarée. 
Il a ni sa prend piment, et c'est que tes mamans, on m'a salawale, et mon gari mangé avec la petite. It's impossible to find fresh fish here. It's all reserved for the street vendors. Here, the larger pieces of fish are frozen. The aromas of herbs, spices, and vegetables intermingle as you pass from stall to stall. An essential ingredient of Mauritian cooking, pommes d'amour are small and very aromatic tomatoes. These are patty pan squashes. They're very common in Mauritius. Not everyone likes them, but I like them very much. They're very good, especially for babies. Rosabum's house has a remarkable view of the bay. Along with her neighbors, she's trying to preserve the area and protect it from property development. This is a stone, a volcanic stone. There, the ginger's ready, the onion's ready, and the bread is ready. You eat this with olive oil and vinaigrette sauce. This is cress. This is garlic. Here's ginger. Chatini. I'm making fish chatini. Adrienne is helping grating a green mango. Rosamond's cooking is simple but full of the incomparable flavors of fresh market produce. Her husband, André, just had to sit down and eat. He's a lucky man. There's a remarkable structure behind their house. These are lime kilns. We used to cook corals in them. We put the wood at the bottom and the coral on the top. Then we cooked it to make lime, to paint our houses. In the past, lime makers had to maintain a temperature between 800 and 1,000 degrees centigrade. They would continually shovel coral into the kiln to ensure that it was always completely filled. The quick lime was then hydrated with a large quantity of water. Notre Dame Auxiliatrice, dominating the island's northern tip, is another famous icon site in Mauritius. Formerly a small fisherman's church, it has recently been restored. Often photographed, this has become a very popular place for celebrating weddings. Disfigured for years by anarchic urban development, Grand Bay offers a very different picture today from the charming seaside resort that it once was. A more pleasant spot is Pointe aux Canonniers, where the great Mauritian families from Port Louis once had their summer homes. Due to their location, these villas are highly prized today. Quandemir Island is a few kilometers offshore. Humpback whales from the South Pole gather here every southern winter in June. They reproduce here every two to three years.
During the 18th century, the French East India Company administered the island for the Kingdom of France. A battery of cannons was built to ensure defense of the north side. In those days, Mauritius was known as the Ile de France. It was a strategic point of passage for the great European nations who rivaled each other to control the route to India. The Pointe de Canonnier artillery consisted of about 15 to 20 cannons. They were concealed by ramparts, which ran all the way around the rocky outcrop. The fortifications also sheltered a gunpowder magazine. The site is now occupied by the Navigator restaurant, run by Nurugun Kupin, the island's greatest chef. He's showing us one of his specialties. Head chef at the Hotel Beachcomber Canonnier. Today's dish is babon gougai with tamarind rice. Of all the tropical fish we have here, such as capitaine, red berry, white berry, parrotfish, my favorite is still the babon. It has an exceptional taste. Its flesh is very tender, cooks well. It never falls apart, and it takes on the flavor of any sauce very well. We're also doing a tamarind rice. Tamarind is frequently used in our cooking. Raw tamarind looks like this. It's made into a paste and then pounded together with salt and oil. That preserves it. Curry leaves are also a common ingredient in Mauritian cuisine. When the Indians first emigrated to Mauritius, they brought along some of their spices. Amongst them were curry leaves. The leaf has a lot of flavor, as well as a lot of health benefits. It's indispensable here. There's a small curry leaf tree in every little garden, and it's used in almost every dish. Come on, let's pick a few leaves. We prepared a special mixture of spices. It's a house secret that my chefs have invented. It imparts a completely different flavor to our curries and rougais. Pommes d'amour are members of the tomato family, but they're slightly more acidic. You have to cook them slowly before you add other spices, such as garlic and ginger. The younger generation uses spices a good deal less in their recipes. Rougai is traditionally composed of chopped vegetables, chopped onions, and chili peppers. Now we let it simmer slowly over low heat. And our rougai is ready. Then it's slightly seasoned with a little lemon juice, just to give it an acidic note. And it's mixed in with garden aromas. Further up the coast is Montchoisy, one of the island's legendary beaches. Every weekend, Families come here to picnic and enjoy the calm sea. However, rising sea levels, erosion, and the presence of invasive filao trees are threatening its coastline. The littoral has receded more than 20 meters over the last 20 years. As a solution to the problem, a rehabilitation plan is to build artificial reefs to help control the swelling water during storm surges. As for tourism, Fortune seems to have paid little attention to Port Louis. It's a noisy and crowded capital. Nevertheless, despite being less attractive than many of the charming villages that we've visited, it is the capital of the island, and a town with character and history, and the wide diversity of its communities give it a very special face. Hinduism is the major religion in Mauritius. It's practiced by more than half the population, Christianity and Islam are also firmly established. 
Hindu temples, Christian churches, and Islamic mosques are often built side by side. The center of town is made up of a heterogeneous group of colonial-style houses, small shops and street vendors. In the market area, Indian shopkeepers have street front stores. In the 19th century, there was a large migration of shopkeepers from India, particularly from the Gujarat region. Many of these people settled in Port Louis, near the central market. This shop is a good example. Here, a family arrived and opened the shop. Now, the third generation or so is still working in the same shop. They import all the rice, lentils, grains, and spices eaten in Mauritius. <laughs> Over the years, the Indian and the Chinese communities have mixed their ingredients. Spices of all varieties are piled up on the stalls but there's also a lot of dried fish and squid. You must never judge a chili pepper by its size or color. The smallest are often the hottest. This wholesaler gets his sacks of rice and flour straight from the holds of a freighter. Sold in smaller packages and sacks, the goods will be retailed all over the island through a chain of tiny shops. These fresh homemade samosas and chili cakes can be eaten any time of the day. People cross the whole city to come and taste them. Five minutes, six. Six minutes. At the age of 77, Monsieur Jacques is the last remaining tin plate craftsman in Mauritius. He began working at the age of 15, but today he can find no one to take over his workshop. Don't mind my age. I'm over 77 years old. And it's time to stop. In the heart of the Chinese district, large murals decorate many of the shops. They're the work of Wena, an active street artist. In the family-run Ho Ning Pharmacy, traditional remedies are still prepared by hand. Seeds, roots, powders, and mysterious extracts are carefully stored in these small drawers. And there are countless other gems waiting to be discovered, such as the Imprimerie City Press, where texts and illustrations are still set by hand. It's a veritable museum in perfect working condition. Mauritius is only a small island in the Indian Ocean, yet it has the power of revealing new aspects of its character with each visit, 
It takes us to extraordinary coves and valleys. It plunges us into an ethnic and cultural fermentation that make the island unique. And it leaves us forever dreaming of its countless treasures, long after we have left its distant shores. 